Before we begin today's episode of Potterless, I wanted to sincerely thank every single person that has listened to this podcast at some point in time, because this is the one year anniversary of Potterless, which is crazy. My little baby is a year old, and I've made some solid progress through the books, but I still have so much more to go. So in honor of that, I gathered some stats about our little podcast. So over the course of this year, 191,000 total downloads of Potterless have occurred, which is ridiculous. That is absolutely insane. That is absurd. That is higher than I could have ever dreamed of. Thank you to all of you. We also have acquired 636 Twitter followers, 283 Facebook likes, 252 Instagram followers, and 82 iTunes reviews. I'm really hoping that in the future I can come back and laugh at how small these numbers sound, but right now these are astronomical and they're huge to me and I cannot believe all the support that the Silly Podcast has gotten. So thank you guys so much. You are an amazing group of people. It's been so much fun to interact with you guys on social media, through Patreon, all this other stuff. The people that I've met through this in the podcasting world are some of the nicest people and are becoming some of my closest friends. This experience is more than I could have ever imagined, and I'm just so happy to have Potterless and the Potterless community and all the other podcasting people I've met because of Potterless. I'm so happy to have all of these people in my life, so thank you guys so much. And speaking of thanks, it's time to thank our newest Patreon supporters. So first, shout out to Christopher Smith for bumping his pledge into the $10 tier, and shout out to Addie Rye and Jonathan Moore for joining the $10 tier as well. Now, speaking of this tier, first off, I've ordered the shirts. So if you are in the $10 above tier, you're getting shirts, they're coming. It's gonna take probably four to six weeks for all of the ordering and then me shipping them to come out, but they're on their way. There are extra shirts, so if you guys do go into this tier eventually, you can still get a shirt, don't worry about that. Also in this tier, at the end of the month, I'm doing a live Q&A, so if you send any sort of email to potterlosspodcast at gmail.com, I will answer that on the live stream. It's gonna be a fun time, a big old party, and of course, Shout out to our producer level patrons, Andreas, Vicky, Aaron, Erica, Calvin, Michael, Sadie, Emily, Chandra, Jesse, Maggie, and Natalie, who have never lost a game of rock, paper, scissors in their entire lives. So without further ado, let's get into episode 25 of Potterless starring Eric Schneider of Spirits Podcast, covering chapters four through eight of Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. <laughs> Potterless, the journey of a 25-year-old man reading Harry Potter for the first time. My name is Mike Schubert, and I am joined again by the editor and producer of Spirits Podcast, Eric Schneider. Eric, how's it going? It's going very well. I'm excited to get into these next couple chapters. I am too, and let's not waste any time. Let's hit right into chapter four, number 12, Grim Old Place, aka the headquarters of the Order of the Phoenix. So in order to make this headquarters come to life, a house basically inflates from an alley between two houses, number 11 and number 13, just kind of like inflates and then pushes the houses away. But the other house doesn't notice because they're hosting a party, which is painfully convenient. I can't, I can't. This is one of the two times in the Harry Potter books where architecture just runs a foul <laughs> for me. And I'm just like, it doesn't make it's <laughs> physically moving something like mm -hmm. there's no amount of crazy spells you can cast where it's like and nobody noticed <laughs> it's like what what are you doing uh, so yeah they just push a house out of the way and the other thing that i think is kind of funny is that it's the this house is number 12 and it appears between number 11 and number 13 that's not sneaky like wouldn't people be like huh why is there no number 12 in between them also House numbers always alternate from across the street. It could be different. Is it different? I've never been <laughs> I, to the I've UK. Never, well, I've been to the UK, but I never like studied the house numbering system. <laughs> the, for, for any non-US listeners where <laughs> the US situation might not be the case, typically mm -hmm. you have odd numbers on one side of the street, even numbers on the other. So yes. 12, 11, and 13 would not be next to each other. Maybe that is actually what makes it sneaky, is that no one would expect a house to be between them. That's true. Uh, so maybe that all the Death Eaters are looking on. on the other side of the street going, where's 12? Yeah. <laughs> Where is it? And it's right behind them the whole time. They just never turn around. It's the perfect cover. Yeah, it really is. So they go inside the headquarters and right off the bat, Mrs. Weasley is there, which is a huge surprise for me, but I'm loving it. She mentions that a meeting has started already, but Harry's not supposed to be let in because it's members only. So 
being ominous. She said that Ron and Hermione are upstairs, which is another pleasant surprise. So Harry finally goes upstairs, and then Hermione runs up, hugs him really violently, and just talks his ear off about how the whole trial is unfair and it's so stupid, and like you had to use the magic and all this other stuff. And Ron apparently also has grown a bunch and to the point where he, when the twins come in later, he's taller than the twins, which isn't the case in the movies, right? I feel like the twins are always like way taller than No, him. Rupert Grint, unfortunately, did not get taller than those very tall boys. <laughs> so that was a shock to me. They tell Harry that Dumbledore made them swear that they wouldn't contact Harry. They wouldn't say anything to him because the risk of an owl getting intercepted was too much. And now with all this headquarters situation, you understand why. Like it makes perfect sense because if that sort of note was to fall into the wrong hands, like they would be so fucked. Everyone would be so screwed. It would be horrible. So at this point, we realize that Ron and Hermione have been at the house together a month with presumably Ron's parents and the Mm -hmm. coming and goings of the order. Yeah. And it just kind of blows me away that, like, this isn't the part where J.K. Rowling decided to have them, like, become a couple at all. Because they're the only... It's just the two of them. They're the only people their age. They're stuck together. I mean, I guess... Fred and George and Ginny are there as well. Sure. But, like, they're spending so much time together because they're already friends. And, like, I'm just amazed that, like, this isn't the point where she was like, time for those two to to get together. Yes, I think so. Because you got to think, they're going to be spending a lot of time just them because they're not allowed to go to the meetings. They're not in the club. They're presumably sharing a room maybe, but I guess Ginny's there too. But still, you would very much think that this would lend itself. And yeah, and Fred and George can apparate at this point, so mm-hmm. they they don't have to be there the whole time. Yeah. It's just, it's just a very, it's an interesting choice, and yeah. I'm, I'm not opposed to it by any means. I was just like, huh, they were together for a month, and they're just like, we're still friends. Yeah. I mean, maybe Ginny is a profound cock block. Like maybe, <laughs> maybe she's just unheard of cock blocking consistently. Either that, or maybe it does happen, and they just don't mention it. I don't know, because I haven't read the book. There is so. a lot of fanfic about this month. I Ooh. guarantee it. Oh, yeah, there's got to be. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if, like, that's the reason why they didn't talk to Harry, and they're like, oh, shit, we never wrote to Harry. Uh, Dumbledore <laughs> wouldn't let us. <laughs> that's it. Yep, nothing nothing else. They were just smanging for a month. They were like, oh, damn it, Harry exists. He's going to be so pissed. He gets mad about everything. <laughs> But yeah, Harry legitimately gets upset with them for not disobeying Dumbledore, which, come on, Harry, he's Dumbledore. Like, he is Albus freaking Dumbledore. He always knows best. He's never made a mistake. He's perfect. He knows what's best for everyone and everything. And he's like, uh, you didn't disobey the orders of Dumbledore. You guys aren't my real friends. And I just like, uh, come on. Everything makes so much sense. And I get that you're going through a lot, but. Get it together, Harry. There are bigger things at stake than you living at the Dursleys for a month and not hearing from anyone. Like, come on. (sighs) Frustrating. It is. It definitely is. It's super bad. So after getting mad at them for not disobeying Dumbledore, he he realizes that he kind of just wants to be alone. But they try to claim, you know, it it was for your safety, it was for your own good, and hey, you had Order of the Phoenix members listening and watching you and keeping you safe, blah, blah, blah. He gets even more upset because now he's like, oh, so everyone knew except for me? I'm the only person that doesn't know what's going on? It's like, oh, Harry, come on, dude. So apparently Dumbledore was super freaking pissed at Medungus for leaving his shift early. He's just livid about it, which makes sense because he had one job and one thing to do. And he left Harry in danger. And Harry almost got murdered and Dudley almost lost his soul. That he would did have, had have a second huge... job, which was picking up bootleg cauldrons. <laughs> Let's not forget about his very important second job. Uh, I feel like if you're in the Order of the Phoenix, I feel like Dumbledore is going to hook you up. Do you really need to be doing these side criminal gigs for a couple illegal cauldrons? Uh, really? Well, he needs he needs the illegal gigs because we find out oh, that right. he's part he's of the mole. order yeah. because he has ties to the wizarding underworld. Yeah, he's basically a mole. So you got to keep on that cauldron grind in order to get those good <laughs> contacts for Dumbledore. So Harry, again, is upset that Ron and Hermione know what's going on and he doesn't. But they both have to tell him, like, hey, we don't actually know what's going on. We aren't allowed to go to these meetings. They're very hush-hush about stuff. We have no clue what's happening. And Hermione's being an absolute angel this whole time because she starts every sentence with things such as, I would be upset too, or I understand why you're so mad, or I totally get it. Like, she's trying to sympathize with him, even though Harry's being 
pretty unreasonable. She tries to side with him as best as she can, and Harry doesn't recognize this at all. And uh, Hermione's just so good. No one deserves Hermione. She's so wonderful. She's like the she's best. the best person. She's uh, definitely she's... the best of the three of them, hands down. Yeah, I feel like I can't think of a. I mean, it's like her versus Dumbledore, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. know who else is in competition. <laughs> After they tell him, Harry, we don't know what's going on, he doesn't care and goes on another, like, I'm Harry freaking Potter tirade. But this one is way longer than the one at the beginning of the book. He cites every single thing that's happened in the previous books that he saved them from, mentions that he saved the world, put in danger, I'm Harry Potter, you guys wouldn't be in here without me, like, blah, 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 blah. And this is literally the point where I put down the book and I paced around my apartment for a while. <laughs> and I wrote in my notes, quote, I'm so done. If I wasn't doing Potterless, I would stop reading this book right now. And I'm not <laughs> even kidding. Like if I was just reading this book for leisure, I would have spark noted until stuff got interesting. Is this where he starts yelling at them in all caps? Yes. Because it's I was just like, man, I get it. It's rough. It's undeniably rough. Mm -hmm. You think that Dumbledore and the crew would have just like found a place for him to stay every summer that would have been nice. But, like, you think on another level, Harry could just, like, hunker down and be like, same shit, different summer. Yeah. And he just doesn't. Every year, everything ends up being okay. But he just doesn't have the patience to realize that it's going to be okay. I was, I was very frustrated reading this chapter. But I trudged through and powered on because everyone tells me that the end of book five is really good. So Harry then outbursts in all caps still. is like, isn't anyone going to tell me what the Order of the Phoenix is? So Hermione says it's a secret society founded by Dumbledore, and it's pretty much all of the people who fought against Voldemort last time he was rising to power. The twins then enter. They apparate in, which is pretty dope. Now that Fred and George know how to apparate. <laughs> they have a great line where Fred tells Harry, oh, Harry, no need to bottle up your anger. Let it all out. Make sure everyone within 50 yards hears you. Like, oh, so the twins are perfect. They're so good. They're so good. They're absolutely perfect human beings. So the twins try to show them their new invention that they've made, extendable ears, which basically are really long, stretchy ears that you can use to hear stuff going around. And they try to, to make it sneak through the door to the meeting, but there's been a spell placed on the door where the ears can't penetrate it, so their little gag gift doesn't work. You learn more about the people that are there. You learn that Snape is a member of the team. So Ron, Hermione, and Harry are all upset about this. They're like, oh, why is Snape here? What's he doing? They still don't trust Snape, which I get is fine. I guess I'm skewed because I know he's good in the end. I really wish I didn't know he was good. That's the one spoiler that makes me upset is that... It is tricky. It is. If I didn't know that he was good, I would be the most anti-Snape person ever because of that shit he pulled on Hermione with the teeth. Like I will that's so unforgivable to me. I mean, I think it I think it's I think it's better to view especially as you get into this book and the next two view it more as not that Snape is good. You could read it as good, but it's more that Snape does just enough to redeem himself. Okay. Like, I think that's the better way of viewing it so that you're feeling less spoiled. Like, because it, it's definitely more of a Snape does enough to correct the record okay. than Snape turns out to be the hero of heroes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's a good way to put it. I am glad that there's a bunch of people that I've had on the podcast or talked to, and it's come up in episodes like with Rosiana and Melissa and Vanessa, not in the episode, but when I was talking to her, is that they're like, oh, I, I didn't forgive Snape. I hate him. He's a piece of shit. And I was like, oh, cool. I thought everyone yeah, liked no, him. He, he definitely is. He definitely is. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad to know that I'm not alone. I thought I thought everyone like was, you know, did a, a 180 on him. But there's a lot of very smart people that I know that are still kind of anti Snape. And exactly what you're saying. It's like, yeah, he did some good stuff, but he's still a jerk. While the kids are kind of grumbling about Snape being on the team, Ginny says, yeah, Bill doesn't like him either. And when I was reading this, I was like, oh yeah, that settles it. And then the narrator says after this quote, as if that settled the matter. And I was like, oh, nice. And like high-fived my book. I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> Get the book. Get it along. Oh, so good. Yeah, it's like me and narrator are just bonding. It's good for you guys to like, to like get along after that hard part where Harry's just <sighs> yelling at everybody. It's good to make up. I don't view the narrator as Harry. I view it as sometimes Harry, but sometimes not. Because the narrator is also not afraid to point out when Harry does some dumb shit. Yeah, yeah. Like when Harry's an idiot, which is often. You learn that Bill was apparently in Egypt 
but he applied for a desk job at Gringotts so that he could be in the country to be on the guard for the Order of the Phoenix, which is pretty sweet. You also learn that Fleur is working at Gringotts like she said she was going to at the end of book four to try to improve her English. And apparently her and Bill are like kind of a thing and Bill's giving her English lessons, which I think is interesting that uh, I, that wouldn't be the pair I would say. I would have thought more of like Charlie and Fleur because I think Bill's kind of lame or at least he looks lame. His style is lame, but it was pretty really, he was like probably really cool in the early 90s, but it's like ponytail, fang earring, dragon skin yeah. boots, potentially a fedora, you know? Pot- potentially a, f- a wizarding fedora. <laughs> a wizard fedora. So you learn that Charlie is still in Romania, but he's been recruiting foreign wizards for the Order of the Phoenix, which is great. I hope that becomes a side plot of like Charlie rolling in with a bunch of international wizards, but I doubt that would happen. I think it would be super dope if it does, though. We'll have to see. And then Harry asks, oh, how's Percy doing? And awkward silence, silence across everyone in the room. The room. <laughs> <laughs> so you learn from the, the Weasley kids that... Percy is a is a sore subject among the Weasley household because, because him and Arthur got into this very intense fight. So you learn that Percy got a promotion despite screwing up this Crouch thing royally and not realizing that Barty Crouch was under the possession of Voldemort. Freaking idiot. So he gets a promotion to be the junior assistant to the Minister of Magic, which... He's freaking out about, he, you know, wants to brag to the whole family, all kind of stuff like that. And also, it seems like he got this way too young. Oh, for sure. That's essentially, like, junior assistant to, like, the, the prime president. minister. Like, yeah. it's it's a pretty high up position for, like, a kid mm-hmm. that graduated, what, like, four years ago? It's like, what, 23, no. maybe? No, I think even, I think it was just two years. Because his crouch job was his first job out of college, or out right, of high so, like, so, y- a young kid in a very, very yeah. close to power. But you do later learn that there could be some sketchy implications to it. So, when Percy got this promotion, he came home to to brag about it, thinking that Arthur would be impressed. But Arthur actually got really mad, because Fudge has been going around making sure that no one is talking to Dumbledore, about Dumbledore, or kind of stuff, all kind of stuff like that. He's threatening people that they would be fired if they talk about Dumbledore in the ministry, which is absolutely absurd and ridiculous and a little reminiscent of our current president. Hey, hey, hey. Donald Trump hates talking about Dumbledore. He really does. <laughs> true. <laughs> Come true. on, Donald Trump hasn't read a book. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. That's why he hates it. <laughs> what are these people talking about? He thinks he'll get. He'll, he always thinks he'll get Dumbledore and Gandalf quotes confused, so he doesn't <laughs> talk about either of them. Oh my god, it's probably true. Man, you know what the craziest thing is? It wouldn't be surprising if, like, in two minutes, Donald Trump tweeted an inaccurate Dumbledore quote. Like, <laughs> we're living in America when that's not, like, an impossibility. <laughs> not all those who wander are lost. Dumbledore. <laughs> yeah, it's that's literally could happen in <laughs> while we're recording. I mean, you can't put anything past him. You really can't. All right, let's, let's not do this. Uh, I don't want to talk about him ever. So... Fudge, in addition to not liking Dumbledore, suspects Arthur of talking to Dumbledore being in cahoots, so Fudge has also been anti-Arthur Weasley. Arthur is convinced that Fudge only hired Percy as an assistant so that Fudge can kind of spy on the Weasleys because he thinks something's up. He tells this to Percy, and Percy gets super pissed. He says that it's been so hard dealing with his dad's reputation and that his dad's lack of ambition is why they are poor, which is something you don't tell your father. No, like you your don't. nice person, saint of a being father. You tell him you have a lack of ambition that makes our family poor. Uh, no, maybe you guys have 12 kids. <laughs> like, come on. That's probably why you're not doing so hot monetarily. Uh, it's frustrating. And Percy doesn't even stop at this. He goes on to call them idiots for siding with Dumbledore. Literally calls his parents idiots. And he vows to disown the family if they choose to be associated with him. It's like Percy just cementing himself as the actual villain. Just too much. Yeah, I mean, just way too the much, real man. villain of these books is Percy. Like, not Voldemort. Yeah, Voldemort is bad. He kills people, whatever. <laughs> Percy's a piece of shit. <laughs> how how surprised will you be if at, if in book seven it turns out that Percy has been in league with oh, Dumbledore the whole not time? Not at all. Zero percent. <laughs> like zero percent at all. He better. Be, I will be mad at Percy if he doesn't become a Death Eater because <laughs> then he's just dumb. 
Because <laughs> then he's just kind of a dick. Then he's a dick, and he had no idea that Crouch was He's not possessed. like an evil guy that wants power. He's just mean. And, uh, he's, uh, he's the worst. He's the worst kind of person. So Percy then moves out that night. Just moves out, leaves, lives in London now. The twins also mention that if you apparently ever mention Percy's name around the parents, Molly begins to cry, and Arthur will break a glass if he's holding it, which is amazing. I yeah, love it. Yeah, it's really it. intense. <laughs> yeah, very dangerous and intense, but I kind of like that rage in Arthur. Do we ever learn how far you can apparate to? No, I don't like think they the ever. Distance? They haven't said it because, yet. Because, like, surely, like, the real estate around the Weasley household, which I have suddenly forgotten the name of. Oh, the, the uh, oh, uh, it's not the Shire, but it's basically the same thing. <laughs> I don't. It's like the the not, not the Hollow. No, I think it is the Hollow. Is it the Hollow? I think so. maybe. Well, let's say it's the uh, Hollow. I'm sure the real estate around there is way cheaper than London. Like, why would you move to London if you can teleport to London? Yeah. Like, just get a just get like a five bedroom house in like the North Country, and then just warp into work like that'll save you so much money oh it's the burrow i googled it because twitter would destroy me if i didn't get this right on the episode it's the burrow the burrow <laughs> because i still get messages yes, every single day about sense. the weatherby thing like once a day people will be like oh uh i don't know if you noticed uh but weatherby is very similar to weasley and he was trying to call him by his last name and he got it wrong it's like guys i get it all right like i messed up i thought he was gonna be nice and call Percy by his first name, but every day I wake up to, hey, love the podcast, but <laughs> Weatherby this, is actually... This one's all me, guys. Send all of your tweets to <laughs> at Ted Cruz uh, about me getting it wrong on this podcast. <laughs> oh, man. The Weasleys then go on to tell Harry that he apparently appears within the prophet a lot. He's basically become a stand-in joke. Harry, at first thinks wait is this is this rita i thought she wasn't writing for them anymore mine's like no 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 she's not it's basically they're them just building on what she said so harry has kind of just become synonymous with over dramatic because of his fainting so they'll say stuff like oh it was a story fit for harry potter or no need to act like a harry potter so what major publication is trying to smear the image of a 15 year old kid what? A 50 year old kid who was murdered by his, like the worst yeah, guy. His, his, or parents his parents were murdered, were murdered by like the he has worst a 15 guy. 15 year old orphan that has fought Satan three and a half times. Yeah. <laughs> and they're just like, you know what we should do? Shit on this kid because <laughs> he likes Dumbledore. It is kind of, it's, a, it's a very bold move by this, by this local newspaper. <laughs> Yeah, I want to know, like, what is the parallel for the prophet? Is it actually a well-renowned source, or is it the National Enquirer? Because it feels like the National Enquirer. I don't know. Do we ever? I don't think we ever learned about other like wizarding. They're, newspapers. They haven't said a single other newspaper. They, this is the only one that exists, but it just seems like a tabloid. It really does not seem as if this is a reputable source in any way, shape, or form. So then, Mister and Missus Weasley come in. They mention Creature, who is the house elf there, and he is a fun little character that comes into play the next few chapters. Ron calls him nuts because his goal in life is to have his head mounted on the walls like all of the other house elves of this house, which is a terrifying decoration and super weird. Like, can you imagine, even if you live in a world where you have a butler or people that work for you, when they die, you're like, oh, here's what we should do. Taxidermy their head and put it on the walls. That's terrifying. Why would we do this? Why is this a good idea? It's also crazy because, like, the elves are, like, they, they really, they're, we've, you've been mm -hmm. into this, like, that they're, like, too into servanthood yes. and all that. But, like, they're still, like, sentient. Deer aren't sentient. No. So we can put their head on sure. a wall and it's socially acceptable. Elves have thoughts and stuff. Yeah, they're pretty much people. Like, they, they're, I mean, I guess it will happen later whenever spew comes to fruition. But I, uh, it's it's just weird because you're right. They're it's very I don't know. weird because I even think putting animal heads up is kind of weird. So to do it to someone that has thoughts and feelings and emotions and somewhat free will, I don't know. Super strange. Not feeling it. I feel like there's that point where like last book she was like, okay, this is gonna start to get a bit darker. Sure. She kills a character. That kind of stuff happens, and then like. 
and this one she's like let's see how far you can push it and this got like too much into like yeah. weird b horror film yeah, territory You're definitely like, creepy. nope you gotta you gotta pull it back just, just a bit, bit. <laughs> So Hermione tries to defend Creature because of her whole spew thing. Again, you get into Ron calling it spew and Hermione saying, it's not spew, it's spell out what S-P-E-W stands for. I still think she should have gone with the original name, which had 15 letters in it. I already forgot the acronym. And then a painting starts freaking the fuck out. You'd find out that it's Sirius's mom yelling at him, which makes me think, so when you die, do you become a painting? Like, how does that work? Like if a <laughs> this has never been explained. Okay. It's also never been explained. If there's multiple paintings of the same person. What's going on? Uh huh. And it it bothers me a lot. Not like as a, as, a, as a storytelling device. Just like internally, I'm just like, oh man, do they like do you like get split up into all of the paintings? It's very it, it's it's weird. It's very and odd. I feel then you can leave your painting. Maybe it's just one. If you get painted in multiple places, you can only in be in one of the paintings True. at once. Mm-hmm. I have no idea. It's strange. And this is one of the instances where. Harry notices something weird and then doesn't ask a question about it. Harry's very good at something weird happening and then just being like, huh, that's weird. And then moving on with his life in his apathetic phase. I don't get why he doesn't go to Sirius like, wait, your mom's a painting? How does this work? And then Sirius can be like, well, actually, you know, when you die (laughs) and then they can explain it. But now Harry just doesn't care. He just thinks, huh, strange. And then end of chapter four and we get into chapter five, the order of the Phoenix. I do like that chapter five of book five has the same name as the title. I thought that was kind of fun. It's I think it's fun. It's very smart. I don't know if it was intentional that way, but I like it. The other thing I like about these chapters and it's specifically with four through eight is that if there was no break, it's kind of just one consistent thing. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things where chapter four ends on a dialogue line and then chapter five begins with the next piece of dialogue. So I think it was kind of cool that in other chapters with the book, I feel like in all the other ones, it's like a chapter ends. It's a very distinct end to a chapter. Whereas here, it's just like, we're going, we're going, shit's happening, we're going, we're on. And I thought it was a nice, it was a cool change of pace. I feel like this book had a different feel to the beginning, especially in the beginning, is that I feel that a lot of the other books, like you said, start off really slow. And this one kind of just gets it fucking going. And I like it. So chapter five, The Order of the Phoenix. Sirius reveals that this is his parents' house. He's the last black alive, so it's been left to him. And he decided to donate it to Dumbledore to use as the Order of the Phoenix headquarters so that it could be put to good use. Mundungus reappears. He says that the reason that he left was for a business opportunity because he's questioned of why he left Harry alone. And Sirius then reveals that he can't use his dog disguise anymore because Peter Pettigrew obviously has now told Voldemort. So Sirius is basically just stuck in this house permanently all the time, which makes me question... Why didn't he just stay here when people were looking for him when he escaped Azkaban? Like, why did he go to the mountains? Yeah, I've never thought about that. Because later in the chapter, they mentioned specifically that it has a really intense security system from when it was owned by the Blacks. And once Sirius gave it to Dumbledore as headquarters, Dumbledore put a bunch of spells on it. So all the stuff where that it's like for Hogwarts, like muggles can't see it. You can't find it on a map. People can't look for it. Like no one knows where it is. No one knows that it exists. The only way you know it is if you write a handwritten note to another wizard and then immediately destroy it. So why didn't he? Is it possible that he wasn't able to get the extra security from Dumbledore until like until somewhere later. during book four? Right. Cause the, Oh, that could be it because the order of the Phoenix wasn't intact until Voldemort came back. So maybe yeah. when Voldemort's back, then Dumbledore puts that in. The other thing that's in play is that he didn't want to stay there because as you learn in this chapter, he fucking hates his family a lot and they're the worst. Yep. <laughs> so Sirius mentions to Harry that he's also upset with Dumbledore. So then Harry starts liking him again. Harry was mad at Sirius until he says, oh, Dumbledore, kind of upset with him because he's keeping me in the dark. And now Harry's like, hey, I like you, which is uh, the only thing he can bond about is someone's angst nothing like being mad at one friend to bond with another friend (laughs) yeah it's very enemy of my enemy thing so fred and george try to set the table with magic but they spill shit everywhere and molly yells at them saying like oh just because just because you guys are full-fledged wizards now doesn't mean you can just use it for everything like a remedial test just pick it up and fred (laughs) Fred and george are like come on don't be such a buzzkill blah 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 Molly just kills it in these chapters. Molly's rank in terms of overall Weasley rank just skyrockets in these next few chapters. It's fantastic. Dinner begins. A bunch of stuff is going on. So you've got Tonks making her face 
change shapes into funny noses and stuff. You've got Arthur and Sirius talking about the goblins, trying to get them on their side, but the goblins are still mad at wizards because, one, they never got their money from Ludo Bagman, my favorite character, and the ministry covered it up and didn't get Bagman in trouble. So they're not super feeling wizards at this point in time. Mundungus is telling the tales of his business, and everyone's laughing, but they never describe the details, which I know makes you very sad. You don't actually learn what yeah. he's saying. They just say that he I is. I just want to know a little bit more. Like, what does he even do? And how much do cauldrons cost? And why do people need them illegally? It seems like a basic household object. Like, this seems like a cauldron would be like someone buying black market refrigerators <laughs> or an oven or something. It seems like an appliance. Yeah, I mean it's it's one of those it's one of those things that is very like what is the scale of the wizarding world mm-hmm. issues that I feel like if you think about too long in the Harry Potter series, it, it you you just get yeah. lost down a rabbit hole. <laughs> You're like it feels like every house would need one cauldron. You probably get one upon graduating, mm-hmm. and then you have one. Like, you, how often do you need to replace a yeah. cauldron? I don't know. I have no idea. Interesting. Sirius then tells Harry that Mendungus is a crook, and that's what makes him useful is that he knows all the other crooks, so he's a mole. Then there's a big argument between Molly and Sirius about whether or not they should tell Harry the truth about what's going on. And it kind of just boils down to both of them kind of being parent figures for him. Like, Molly's basically his de facto mom and Sirius is kind of like his de facto dad and they just have different opinions Sirius very much thinks that Harry should know the truth Molly thinks that they shouldn't and they both think that they know what's best for Harry and they're kind of arguing about that I thought it was interesting I thought it was good and it really did show how much these two people cared about Harry which is really sweet it was I think it was a good character move for both of them yeah eventually Molly says okay fine we'll tell him what's up Because Lupin at one point steps up and is saying, look, it's better that we tell him the truth rather than him hear a somewhat true version of the truth from a rumor. So Molly agrees and says, "Okay, but the kids have to leave. And they're all getting really mad. And my initial thought is like, yeah, like Harry's not just going to tell them all afterwards. But then Ron immediately says that he's like, wait a second, mom. Harry's just going to tell us afterwards. Right. And Harry doesn't immediately say yes. He first considers not telling them just to spite them and be like, see how they like it. It's like, God, Harry. Rude. Like, he, A bit uh, rude. He can't be nice for five seconds. But Harry eventually says, no, that's, that's mean for me to think, and tells Ron, yes, of course I'm going to tell you. So Molly's like, fine. Ginny, you still have to leave. So <laughs> Poor Ginny. Ginny just gets the short end <laughs> of the stick. Harry asks the everyone in the order, what's going on with Voldemort? What's his status? Should I be scared? Etc. They say that they're not sure, that he hasn't killed anyone, but Dumbledore has a theory of what's going on. They don't know what his theory is, but he's working on it or whatever. But all you know at this point in time is that Dumbledore wants to build up his army again, which has me super excited, before Voldemort builds up his, which has me also really excited because I know what to expect from Dumbledore's army. It's going to be a bunch of wizards who are good guys. But what kind of evil shit is Voldemort going to bring in? Because he's going to have giants and dementors and evil evil people. Like, it's exciting for me to think of Voldemort assembling an army. Because I don't even know who's in play. Yeah, I feel like Voldemort, you definitely expect more magical creatures. Mm -hmm. And Dumbledore, you expect just kind of human wizards. Yes. Because Voldemort doesn't care if he wreaks havoc on a town or destroys stuff. Like, he can have dragons. He can have literally whatever he wants. It's, it's much easier to be a villain, oh, yeah. as you've seen any in Avengers movie. They just destroy all the buildings, and they're like, this is what we do, yay! <laughs> yeah. The Order says that Fudge is scared of Dumbledore because he's worried that Dumbledore wants to usurp him as the Minister of Magic, but everyone knows that that's not the case. Everybody knows this, but Fudge is still paranoid about it. And I feel like, as we find out in the last chapter that we'll be covering in this one, like, Dumbledore is definitely playing into that too, though. <laughs> so I feel like Dumbledore is definitely, like, doing some stuff that's hinting these, like, yeah, I want to I wanna be in charge. <laughs> but he doesn't. Uh, Dumbledore in Chapter 8, amazing. Like, God-tier Dumbledore. It's great. Sirius then goes on a tirade about how Fudge is a big coward, and it's wonderful. Harry starts asking Lupin and Sirius what Voldemort would do once he regains the team, and at this point is when they mention some sort of weapon. They don't really go into detail, but they hint at dump, at Voldemort having this big, scary weapon. And then Molly just sends them to bed. 
Harry, before going to bed, yells that he wants to join the order. And Lupin's like, come on, dude. It's only for adults. And then Harry goes to sleep. And that's the end of chapter five. <laughs> chapter six, the noble and most ancient house of black. First thing right off the bat, the phrase danker is used in this chapter, which is great. <laughs> they describe the room as being danker. <laughs> Very good. Ron and Harry try to theorize about what Voldemort's up to. They try to figure out what the weapon is, but they just can't. There's a rumbling in a desk, and all the wizards agree that they should wait for Moody because they don't know what's going on. But here's where you get into a bunch of pages about cleaning. They're cleaning these curtains, which have doxies in them, which are like these tiny little like four-armed, four-legged angry tinkerbells basically yeah pretty much and they just have to get them it's very much like the denoming that they did before i don't know if this is just like a weasley thing where they got to get rid of tiny pests yeah <laughs> and and while they're doing this they're getting rid of these doxies fred saves the venom he saves one of the dead ones because he wants to use their venom to test on a candy that will make you ill enough to throw up and then the other side of the candy makes you feel better again so you would use it to like get out of class or a meeting or something Fred and George are geniuses. They're geniuses. This this one of their of the inventions that they go over, this one definitely worries me the most in terms of its <laughs> health implications. It's making you sick on purpose. Because I was like, I don't think you should be taking this very often. The rest of them are like silly ears <laughs> and a couple other things. I'm like, I don't this one this one seems bad, man. <laughs> so mendungus returns with a bunch of cauldrons molly is super pissed about it fred and george scold the order of the phoenix for letting her hit her stride they're like oh come on you can't let her get momentum like you got, you got to stop her from arguing first otherwise she'll just go on a tirade which is just continually great commentary from fred and george and then you learn more about the Black family thanks to Creature. So Creature, the house elf, comes in, mentions that he was originally Mrs. Black's and that she would be so upset to see all these wizards here, especially Sirius. He hates Sirius because they think he's a traitor, blah, blah, blah. Lots of third-person talk, which is my least favorite thing ever. All of that other good stuff. You pretty much learn that Sirius despises his family, absolutely hates his family. He ran away at age 16 because he just couldn't take it anymore, and he stayed with the Potters. And the reason that he hates his family is because they're very pure blood centric. They're one of the people of the camp that wizards should only marry wizards and get with wizards, and mudbloods are bad, and muggles are bad, and hooking up with muggles is not a good thing and the family basically disowns any member of the family that doesn't marry a pure blood and Sirius was just like fuck this at age 16 and just peaced out that's the way to do it and we cover most of this through a tapestry <laughs> in which all of the names that that mother black didn't like are just like yep. burnt out with which probably with a spell but i like to imagine her like using a cigarette because i feel like it's <laughs> slightly more devious yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, yes, it's a tapestry that's a big family tree. And from this, you learn a couple other interesting things. So you learn that Sirius is related to Tonks because Tonks' mom is his, is his mother's cousin. Tonks' mom had two sisters, one of which is Bellatrix uh, and the other of which is Narcissa. Bellatrix being Bellatrix Lestrange, who we know is a Voldemort supporter. And Narcissa, you learn, is freaking Lucius Malfoy's wife, which is... Ugh. so Sirius Black is related to like the weirdest and evilest people he's related to like every bad person other than Voldemort mm -hmm. and when Harry brings this up Sirius is basically says yeah that's gonna happen if you're a pure blood nut it's only gonna be a couple families involved and he mentions that the Weasleys are basically the only family that kind of stayed away from this weird incesty pure blood kind of thing it's not necessarily incest but it's like a lot of family trees that connect tangentially. Yeah. So it, it was weird and creepy. So you find out he's related to, to the Malfoys and to Tonks, which is one thing is cool, one thing terrible. Harry, when he hears Beltrix, is like, that sounds familiar, and then realizes that it was the four people from the memory he saw in the last book. So it's Bellatrix, her husband, Rodolphus, Barty Crouch Jr., and then Rodolphus's brother. Those are the four people that you know went to Azkaban and said that they will be repaid, uh, and they're they're still there except for Barty Crouch Jr., who's dead now. This is where they mention the house having all the security and stuff like that. And when Sirius tells Harry about this, Harry says, hey, if I am acquitted from this trial, do you think I could live with you? 
And Sirius is like, oh, whoa, that would be super cool. Because Sirius had before been saying he wish he could leave the house. He wish he could kind of see Harry grow up and all this stuff. Very father figure-ish again. And then Harry raises his point, which would be dope. I really hope this happens. I don't know if it does, but that would be the coolest thing. So then Harry's getting ready for his hearing. Mrs. Weasley irons his clothes in preparation. Sirius begrudgingly says that he's not going to join in the hearing. And you learn that this is because Dumbledore came in last night to tell him that he shouldn't go along with them, which of course he shouldn't. Like, why was this even up for debate? Like, people still think he's guilty, right? Yeah, I don't understand his logic. He's like, I could I could use uh, use the um, whatever spell they put cast on Harry to make him, like, invisible or look like somebody else. And I was like, I think the Ministry probably has a way of checking for that. Yeah, like, what, is the, Surely. what is the benefit of having Sirius there? It's not like he's going to testify on Harry's behalf. Everyone's convinced he murdered 13 people. It's ridiculous. I don't understand why Harry and or Sirius thought that was a good idea at any point in time. Good emotional support. <laughs> I mean, you'll definitely get found guilty, but strong emotional support. <laughs> but when Harry learns this, that Dumbledore came in last night and didn't speak to him, Harry feels bad. <laughs> and then you get, that's the end of chapter six, and you get into chapter seven, the Ministry of Magic. This chapter, pretty much useless. Nothing really happens. It's mostly traveling. Yeah, it's a lot of travel. Oh, we do find out... I think we mentioned it in the last episode, but we didn't get to it, that we find out that uh, Kingsley Shacklebolt, yes. Shacklebolt mm-hmm. his job is to find Sirius. Yeah. And he has been leading the entire ministry on on just wild goose yeah. chases the entire time, which which is great. It is super good. And like we, we bump into him in this chapter. Yeah. So the first thing to note in this chapter, the very first thing is it's like, Harry put on his iron t-shirt and jeans in preparation for the hearing, which is like, what the fuck? You're getting tried for potentially never being able to be a wizard again, and you're wearing a fucking t-shirt and jeans? Like, throw on a collar, Harry. Mike, it's an ironed (laughs) t-shirt. Like, like, come on, something with buttons, dude. Like, uh, terrible. Absolutely terrible. So, uh, so Tonks and Mrs. Weasley kind of give him a little pep talk. So does Lupin and Sirius. And then he goes on with Arthur to the Ministry of Magic. And they decide that they're going to walk there and take muggle transportation so they can lay low and it would look good given what Harry's trial is. Now, here's another thing that raises issues. They go to the subway and they mention that Harry has to deal with buying the tickets because Arthur Weasley is not good with money, as we learned in the last book. But... Arthur Weasley is supposed to be obsessed with muggles, absolutely obsessed with everything they do, and he can't count fucking numbers on a rectangle? See, th- this is where, where Percy's assholery might <laughs> lend some, like, truth. Maybe Arthur is just really bad at his job. Maybe. Maybe the reason the family is poor is because he's... I mean, the man doesn't understand how hu- how, like, normal UK pounds or euros Mm -hmm. work like i mean i feel like most of them just say the number on them and then they do very large like in the corner there's a large five or a large 10 or a large 20 they're all different colors i think they're all different sizes i know the euro is i don't know about pounds the coins have very big numbers like the whole coin is a one it's very easy it is very easy and even if arthur weasley doesn't understand it why does harry potter understand it more he's 15 and he's a ah I guess he, like, lived as a muggle from ages 0 to 10, but Arthur's job, his profession, is to know about muggle stuff, and he can't count. Do they use wizard numbers? Do they not? They they use normal numbers, right? I all, Sometimes I wonder about this. I'm like, I, what else is different? Do they have, like, wizard time? Like, what other wizard things are they doing? Because their money system doesn't make a lick of sense. No, it's weird. But they count galleons, at least in real numbers. Like, they say things such as 10 galleons, right, 5 yeah. galleons. It's not like it's, you know, twiddly dump galleons and flurbity derb schmeckles or whatever. No, they're in real numbers. Yeah. Silver sickles or whatever, not schmeckles. <laughs> Schmeckles is a pretend currency from Rick and Morty. The visitor entrance to the Ministry of Magic is you go to a payphone and you type in a secret code and then you go down through the ground, which you doesn't seem very lower yeah, down. very slowly. Doesn't seem very covert at all. <laughs> Much like the brick wall to get to platform nine and three quarters. How does someone not see like six people go through a brick wall and be like, guys, what the fuck just happened? I wonder if there's you like, see those six people. <laughs> I wonder if there's just like a kind of like a a men in black, whatever those guys had that the the deneuralizer was that the yeah, thing they I, had. I don't know the name. The stuff? flash, the flashy. Thing. I wonder if that like all kind of mad like magic stuff like that 
just kind of has that general effect yeah. around non-magic users. So they just immediately forget that it happens, maybe? maybe. I don't know. But not covert at all. So they get into the ministry, and this is where you see that basically Kingsley Shackelford's job is to lead the ministry on a goose chase. Him and Arthur like loudly yell at each other about trying to find Sirius. They're like, oh, Weasley, I need you to look more into motorcycles. Apparently, Sirius is using another motorcycle again. And then they whisper, oh, Molly's making meatballs tonight if you want to come over. And then loudly is like, oh, you better be right about this. The last thing you had me on set me on like a month. And then it's like, I'll see you tonight. <laughs> like, I hope this scene is in the movie because it's fucking hilarious. And I it's bet, really I bet it's not in the movie but i really hope it is because it was so funny and then the only other thing that really happens of note is that harry waits in arthur's office and his assistant perkins says oh didn't you know that uh the the hearing got rescheduled to a different location and an earlier time and arthur's like what and looks at his watch and they're already late and the whole point of them getting there was that they were going to be three hours early and now they're already late and that is the end of chapter seven then you get into chapter eight, the hearing, aka Dumbledore Sass Fest 2017. Oh, oh it's, it's so, so good. good. It's so it's good. So, good. <laughs> so there there are there are two things I want to mention about chapter seven. Okay, yeah, go for it. They Please. have windows. Oh, the right, magic, right, right, right. And it's underground. It's cool. It's magic windows. I and think it's wonderful. It's like click. It's like Adam Sandler's click. The department that's in charge of them, apparently, when they want pay raises, causes hurricanes. <laughs> <laughs> Which just seems like you would get fired yep. more than you would get a raise because that just sounds miserable. It sounds pretty awful. <laughs> and then the second thing, I mean, those windows are great. I like Oh, that. yes. Oh, they're fantastic. The second thing is that they mentioned that Arthur has like posters of cars because he likes cars mm -hmm. a lot yeah. in his office. And I'd like to imagine that since he doesn't have like the human context of cars uh -huh. that every so often he like bought like a car calendar, but it turned out to be like one of those car calendars with like a hot babe on it. <laughs> and he like just didn't know that that was like a thing. It just got really confused. Uh. And he's like, why is there a woman with this car calendar? <laughs> I just like, as I was reading, I was like, that's a funny thing that I hope that I wish would happen in my version of Harry Potter. This is a man that can't count with dollar bills. I wouldn't put it yeah. past him. <laughs> So, yes. Okay, on to chapter eight. Yeah, yeah. chapter eight, Sass Fest 2017. So, the first thing right off the bat is Harry recognizes the place, and it's the same courtroom from the hearings that he saw from Dumbledore's memory in the last book. So, when they go in, Arthur immediately is like, oh, so sorry, we're late. We didn't know that the place had changed. And Fudge is like, that's no excuse. We sent an owl to you this morning. So Insane. I'm guessing they sent an owl to Harry's home, and they went. But that is some supreme bullshit. Because can you imagine like having a court date for even something like a parking ticket and you're planning your entire day, you leave your house, you're at work, you're like, hey boss, got to leave at 10 o'clock so I can go to the court, whatever, whether it's jury duty or anything. And they send a letter to your house that freaking morning. Fudge is like not justified in saying like, oh, we sent an owl to you. It's like, no, dude, you can't cancel stuff a couple hours before it starts. It's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's the craziest thing. It's also like, I don't know, anti-bureaucracy bureaucracy somehow, sure. which I feel like the Ministry of Magic surely has a ton of bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. So you learn that this whole change is basically to try to keep Dumbledore away. When Harry gets in there, he sees a bunch of wizard at the front bench. One of them is Percy. He is noted as being the scribe for the hearing. And Dumbledore is there, and right off the bat, it's revealed that Dumbledore is Harry's defense attorney. Now, I don't know what Dumbledore's going on that he didn't tell Harry this or give him any sort of heads up. I'm assuming he's just super busy with all of the Voldemort stuff that he was just didn't have the time to step aside. But, but Harry just kind of walks in. It's like, yes, your defense attorney will be Albus Dumbledore. And he's like, oh, tight, cool. <laughs> so then basically you realize that the, the last minute change that fudge made was to try to get Dumbledore to not show up but Dumbledore right off the bat hits him with a like well good thing I got here three hours early and someone told me which is sweet so then the trial begins and right off the bat fudge lists what the trial is for you know this very long description of like using a using an expecto patronum spell in the muggle world surrounded by muggles blah 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 and after he introduces this, berates Harry on each individual thing. It's like, so Harry, do you agree that you used a Patronus spell? And Harry says, yes, but. And then he goes, in the presence of a muggle. Yes, but. In the muggle world. Like, it's, it's just reading exactly what he said. And Harry keeps trying to yes, but. But Fudge continues to ignore him. I hate Fudge. He's awful. He's, he's terrible. He's, he's really super bad. So Harry then describes what happens. And Fudge 
just right off the bat, he's the judge. You're not supposed to do this at all. You're supposed to be even and not take a side. Right off the bat's like, oh, that's a tall tale, isn't it? And Harry's like, no, that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, he says something like, he says like, oh, how well rehearsed. Yep, he does. It's like also like, even if you're, even if you're telling the truth or lying in court, like typically your statement will be somewhat rehearsed. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to make a good statement. <laughs> that's so valid. Yes, it is rehearsed, but it's also the truth. Yeah. Dumbledore stands up and he's like, well, we have a witness. And Fudge is like, oh, we don't Ooh, have the time surprise to... Surprise witness. <laughs> Fudge, Fudge is like, we don't have the time for a, a witness to read another rehearsed story. And Dumbledore's like, yo, what are you talking... Yes, you do. So Mrs. Fig enters in and she gives a testimony exactly backing up what Harry said to the to the team. Now, they have a whole thing with her about whether or not uh she can see right because she's a the squid mentors and do they do they do you do you know if she can so or not? here's what my thought is i don't i'm not too familiar with the squib stuff but what it seems like is that when she was a wizard she learned about dementors right uh, and then once she became a squib i don't think she but ever are squibs are squibs people that I thought squibs were people that didn't have magical ability, but were born to wizards. So you learn that who's the who's the hall monitor? The hall monitor is a squib because he has yeah. You have wizard parents, but you are not a wizard. Yeah. I think I think that's what it is. I don't think it's someone that's lost their power. I think it's you have wizard parents. Yeah. And you are not a wizard. So maybe she learned about dementors and all the other stuff was happening so maybe it still gets dark and it's cold and harry uses expecto patronum so she right. knows what all of that is but doesn't actually see the dementors because you're right when she gives the testimony she says all this and she reveals that she's a squib so then fudge tries to catch her on a line it's like well what did it look like and, and at first she says she does say it's running oh yeah she says it's running that's the first thing that tipped him off it's like oh they ran towards him and they're like ran and she's like uh, sorry floated hovered, <laughs> hovered. <laughs> and and then they ask her oh what did they look like and she says oh they're very big <laughs> and wearing kilts which i know is i think a british way to wait to do say. they say kilts she does she says kilts i thought she said clothes no so first she says kilts and everybody is confused like what and then i think she corrects herself and says they're wearing cloaks ah. i think that's what happens or dumbledore corrects her and says cloaks or whatever but i immediately imagined a dementor wearing a kilt like a scottish that's dementor very and i was funny. <laughs> I was just thinking, this is way better. This is so much better <laughs> than the creepy, like, Grim Reaper thing that they've got going on. So her testimonies then seem super valid, and everyone is pretty much believing it to be true, except for Fudge. Fudge tries to dispute it, all kind of stuff like that. And that, at this point, Dumbledore is sick of it. So Dumbledore unleashes the Beast of Sass, and it's incredible. Oh, so good. He goes full My Cousin Vinny on this, where he just kind of stands up and says, okay, so I think that these were sent by Voldemort. And Fudge says, no, there's no way. The only people that control Dementors is the Ministry of Magic. And he says, all right, well, if that's true, why did the Ministry attack Harry Potter with Dementors? And then Fudge says, oh, we would never do that. And he's like, yeah, but you just said the only people in control is the Ministry of Magic. So what's going on? Just beautiful lawyering i feel like every sentence very every good. sentence he says could be followed by the lawyered gif from how i met your mother the great series that just didn't have a last episode right it just didn't exist right it didn't have a last season yeah the whole last season just didn't happen it's weird they're just like no sorry we weirdly got canceled after eight we got canceled we're not making this last it's, one it's so strange <laughs> what a terrible ending to a series now, I was also only season four was released on Blu-ray, which really bothers me. <laughs> like it's it's a it's a passion that only exists to me. I don't think anyone else cares about it. But they only released one season of it, and it's season four on Blu-ray. And I just want to buy a box set of How I Met Your Mother. That's amazing. And it just doesn't exist. Well, I mean, probably saved you a bunch of money because that. Uh, I can't. I can't. Anyway, <laughs> continuing on. Umbridge then enters. So this is the first mention of Umbridge. She doesn't have a major role in anything, but she does question one of Dumbledore's accusations that the Ministry is, was sending them. Just when Dumbledore was trying to make a point, I know that Umbridge eventually takes over the school, and this is something to happen later. But for now, she doesn't really play a factor. Fudge then tries to go on this big 
anti Harry slam piece, which is ridiculous. It's, it's it's really weird. It's really pathetic where he tries to cite every bad thing Harry's done in school. Dumbledore first right off the bat is saying, wait, first off, this guy's a kid. Second off, you can't critique him for what he does in school. And third, you guys aren't allowed to expel people from Hogwarts or confiscate wands and break them in half. And he has a great quote where he says something to the effect of, in your attempt to process a speedy use of the law, you seem to have forgotten the law along the way. It's, oh, it's, oh, oh. So <laughs> Just rap horns raining from the sky. Beep, 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 beep. And in response to this quote, Fudge yells, laws can be changed. And Dumbledore goes, yeah, a lot of things are changing. Just how this somehow warrants a full-scale trial for such a minor offense. Dumbledore has a response for literally everything Fudge says, and it's incredible. He's so prepped. He's so prepped. It's absolutely incredible. So after he just murders Fudge with sass, they do a, a poll of the jury to see if he's guilty or innocent, and Harry narrowly wins and is found as innocent, and Dumbledore, once once he's proven innocent, Fudge, you know, makes the announcement. Fudge says, okay, Harry is found innocent. Dumbledore goes, great, and then leaves. Like books <laughs> and books it, just the, disappears. That's the end of the chapter. He just pieces out, and that's the end of chapter eight. And that is also the end of this episode of Potterless. Uh, so, Eric, thank you so much for joining. This was great. How, you. how are you feeling? How, how's it all going with this? Because I'm excited. I was very down in the dumps with how angsty Harry was being, but now I feel great about everything. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember liking this book a lot, like I said in the last episode, and I am excited to uh, hear more about it in your upcoming episodes. Yeah, there's going to be some good guests coming forward. I'm really excited for it. And good, good. I'm glad you're on. This was super fun. I'm glad we got to do yes. this. And uh, if people want to follow you, I'm guessing Spirits Podcast is out there. I don't. If you Spirits Podcast, literally. So in the last <gasps> yeah, episode, did you guys hit it? We started by saying that we were very soon going to hit uh -huh. a million, and literally like three or four minutes ago, I got the notification. Yo! Spirits Podcast just hit a million oh! downloads. Yeah. Which is super, super exciting. That is so absolutely go incredible. subscribe to yes. Spirits Podcast. Uh, just search Spirits on your favorite podcasting app or spiritspodcast.com. And uh, you can follow me uh, pretty much anywhere on the internet at I'm Eric Schneider. Yes. Everyone go check out Spirits. If you haven't thus far, I would be confused because Amanda and Julie have both been on multiple times. Eric, this is your second episode being on. Yes. And it's, it's basically like Comedy Central's Drunk History, but specifically for mythology and way nerdier and it's fantastic it's a and there's there's a harry potter tangent in nearly mm -hmm. every yeah, episode there... <laughs> sometimes there's so many i have to cut a few there out, have be been honest. multiple episodes where julia has to text me on tuesday night hey at 39 15 you can't listen <laughs> and i appreciate it's true. it yeah so we, we've started we've started letting mike know <laughs> when there's spoilers for books that we know he hasn't yeah, read it yet. It started at first where like Amanda would say, hey, don't listen to this part of the podcast. And now it's gotten to the point while you guys are recording, you'll be like, oh, Mike Schubert, stop listening. It's, I feel so honored <laughs> to get really a funny. shout out for one person just to be like, hey, turn this shit off for 10 seconds. <laughs> it's a very odd shout out where it's like <laughs> a shout out to tell you to stop listening to our content. Hey, what's up, Mike? Hit the skip button three times and we're back. <laughs> but it's lovely and I appreciate it. And yes, everyone should go check out Spirits. They're lovely humans. Thank you very much. And Eric, thank you so much for being on. And listeners, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, every single day, wizard on! Yes. Potterless is created by Mike Schubert. It is hosted by Mike Schubert. It is edited by Mike Schubert. It is produced by Mike Schubert as well as Andreas Ozelby, Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Erica and Calvin Bauer, Michael Vanderslice, Sadie Bear, Emily Whiffen, Chandra Cruz, Jesse Horgan, Maggie Zobazek, and Natalie Klobuchar. Web designed by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campamanas. Thank you guys so much for listening. You can find us on any of your preferred podcasting apps, potterlesspodcast.com, twitter.com slash potterlesspod, facebook.com slash potterless, and instagram.com slash potterlesspodcast. If you leave us a rating and review on iTunes, it really does help. It really helps more people find the podcast and, and help get our name out there. And again, thank you guys so much. This has been an amazing year. And until next time, wizard on!